Okay, welcome everyone. Our last session of the EAI conference 2021. Oh, sad face. <laughs> Happy face, but sad face. Uh, so our last session is uh, Dr. Adam Scribner. Uh, he will be talking about educating for environmental change. Uh, learn about educating for environmental change, a free Indiana University program that helps educators effectively teach climate change and participate in exemplar lessons designed to surface students uh, thinking and addressing common misconceptions pertaining to environmental science. Dr. Adam Scribner is the Director of STEM Education Initiatives at Indiana University School of Education, where he bridges theory to practice to develop transformative STEM teaching and learning experiences designed to foster the next generation of engineers, scientists, creators, and innovators. His expertise lies in the areas of the design of K-12 STEM curricular resources, as well as teacher education and professional development around the integration of multiple STEM disciplines. Dr. Scribner currently serves as Principal Investigator of Educating for Environmental Change, a project supported by the IU Environmental Resilience Institute that aims to provide, I'm sorry, aims to improve the teaching and learning of climate change in K-12 schools. Welcome, Dr. Scribner. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, it really is a testament to you that uh, not only are you here at the EAI conference, but the fact that you're here on a weekend, you give up your time uh, for, for ultimately your students. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. So thank you for being here. Uh, I am going to be talking about educating for environmental change. Well, now it's not working. Tassie. <laughs> Dang, Natalie, just got it. I know. All right. Uh, I am going to be talking about educating for environmental change today. Um, and I have a, uh, an aspirational agenda. I'm going to try to do three things in, in this period of time. Uh, but I'm going to move relatively quickly through each. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about our program, Educating for Environmental Change, and how you can get involved in it. Uh, the second thing that I'm going to do is talk a little bit about one strategy that we employ to surface student thinking and address common misconceptions in students. And then the third thing is I'm going to do just an overview of an exemplar activity. And in this case, the exemplar activity is about high schools. So let me start off by talking about uh, oh. Just gonna move us forward. I think I broke it. <laughs> you know what? You it wouldn't be the first time. It's okay. Right. There we go. So first and foremost, educating for environmental change is a professional development program uh, for K twelve teachers and informal as well as formal educators. All of you are welcome to come to to our programs. Um, and what we do is we provide support uh, and follow up and follow up classroom support to teachers uh, to effectively teach the the science and the policy of climate change. Um, but climate change is just one of many topics. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and more importantly, through this program, we are developing a professional learning community of educators throughout the state of Indiana and beyond uh, that are teaching climate change. And so we're trying to support our teachers in many different facets of teaching climate change. Um, overall, the program is designed to help teachers overcome barriers of misinformation, uh, and provide age appropriate and grade level appropriate resources to teachers um, and ultimately improve teacher practices. One of the things that's that's really unique about our program is it's not just me. Uh, this program is made up of an incredible team of IU environmental scientists, uh, some local K-12 teachers, uh, as well as some informal educators, specifically at Wonder Lab. And uh, our program is really designed to get teachers to think about how they can teach climate change and also to support them in their efforts. Sorry. So yeah. a lot of people have this idea that in the state of Indiana, uh, there's not a lot of support for teaching climate change, but in fact, there is quite a bit of support for teaching climate change uh, in the K-12 classroom and in the informal environment as well. In fact, 72% of Hoosiers agree that schools should teach children about the causes, consequences, uh, and potential solutions to climate change. And so. And overall, although this, this slide does not show uh, that they believe that this is human caused uh, global warming, uh, the average American does believe that the climate is warming. And so if they believe that the climate is warming, then they also believe that maybe this should be taught to our students, right? And so you can see that anything above 50% is that yellow, orange. And so across the country, there's wide support uh, 
of, of understanding that our climate is warming. And so now what we need to do is just connect the dots and get people to understand that yes, this, the humans are causing this and that uh, it needs to be taught in our K-12 classrooms as well as in our informal classrooms. One of the things that I wanted to talk about today too is one of the barriers here is our own state science standards. So if you wanna click one more, this is a science standard from eighth grade. Now, all of these standards are currently being revised, but this standard, let's take a look at it. It says research global temperatures over the past century, so 100 years, and then compare and contrast that data in relation to the theory of climate change. And we just look at the standard in general, uh, you might look at it and go, okay, well, it's a standard that explicitly uses the term climate change, and that's a good thing uh, because it might provide support to teachers that, to say, hey, listen, you should be teaching about climate change. But at the same time, if all you're doing is looking at temperatures for 100 years, you're not going to have adequate data to understand climate change or to teach students about climate change. And then secondly, I have no problem with the use of the words theory up here. Uh, if we're going to be talking about science, then theory is a common term in science. Uh, but we don't talk about the theory of gravity in our standards. We don't talk about the theory of evolution in our standards. We're only utilizing it here for the theory of climate change. And so what I'd like to see in our next revision uh, of Indiana State Standards is that this gets revised and that we're talking expi explicitly about climate change without that in front of it. Uh, so if you want to get to the next, and let's contrast this with the words that are utilized in the next generation science standards, which by the way, the next generation science standards have been adopted by the states of Kentucky, have been adopted by Illinois. Many states that you would think that, you know, aren't going to adopt these have. And so this is language that's in their state standards. So they should also be in our state standards. Uh, so for instance, cause the rise in global temperatures over the past century. Excellent. Or uh, changes due to human activity. Excellent. Or climate change in general, just the explicit use of that term. So this is just one barrier that teachers have here in the state of Indiana. And hopefully we'll be overcoming that uh, when we revise the standards in the next uh, year or so. One other uh, misinformation that's out there, I'm sure that many of you have seen this book before or heard about this book, the Heartland Institute, what do you say, Jim, was it like seven years ago, eight years ago, sent this out, is it 350,000 teachers in the United States um, received this book titled, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming, which ignores the consensus, the, the, the consensus that there is uh, about global warming and human caused uh, climate change. Um, and, and one interesting thing is that uh, there was a survey done in 2017 that, that asked the teachers about this book. And many of the teachers that, that they surveyed said, well, it'll help us teach, quote, all sides. Uh, again, ignoring that this is a one-sided issue. Um, and so I, I think my big takeaway from this slide is just getting people to understand that in many cases, this might be the only resource teachers have about teaching climate change. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, yes. It wasn't just teachers. State legislators. State legislators as well. Yeah. But I think that 350,000. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I know, I know that the bulk of them went to, to yeah. teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. So who's on our team? Again, we've got a, a team that that cuts across many disciplines at Indiana University. We have people from SPIA, from biology, from physics, uh, the Environmental Resilience Institute, from the Center for Rural Engagement, uh, myself from the School of Education, and then we have people from uh, Water Lab Museum and local veteran teachers. Uh, our core team, what I love so much about these people is the bulk of them are scientists, but they, they not only care about their science, they care about how their science is communicated. And one of the unique things about our program is that I remember when we started the program, I thinking this will be so great for educators. They're gonna be, have access to IU's climate scientists. This is fantastic. But what's happened is an unexpected consequence is that there's actually bi-directional benefits. Our scientists now think so much more about how they communicate their science because they're working with these experts in communication. They're working with these, these K-12 educators. So it's really been a great program for, for all the people that are involved in it. Now, all of our programs, we have, we have lots of different programs, but, but our core driving questions that we utilize in our programs is how do we know the climate is changing? How are humans accelerating these changes? 
what are the impacts of these changes, and then ultimately what must be done to mitigate the severity and impact of climate change. But our topics are not just about climate change, although they are subsequent to topics of that. Uh, we also talk about biodiversity loss, the degradation of soil and water quality, changes in biogeochemical cycles, invasive species. And of course, we don't want to just teach students about the problems of the world. We also want to empower them to solve them. And so we talk about engineering solutions and policy solutions, and of course, things that they can do to help uh, advocate um, in, their own community, in their own communities. So, so what do we do? We do a lot of hands-on activities, everything from ice core investigations, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes how we do that, uh, sampling tree cores, next slide. Uh, we do a lot of science lessons. Again, we, we um, our scientists think a lot about how, are, how they're teaching science in their own classes and then how we can bring that down to a high school level, to a middle school level, and even to an elementary school level. Um, one of my favorite activities that we do is, uh, this is Richard Phillips, and he does an activity where we do soil respiration. Um, and we get students to to think about it not only qualitatively, but quantitatively, which is something. So in other words, the students can quantitatively see how much carbon dioxide is absorbed by uh, soil. But on the, yeah, when we work with younger students, they will get it more qualitative. Next slide. Um, and then of course we do poster sessions with not only our climate scientists, but also their graduate students and their undergraduate students. So again, what we're doing is we're, we're getting our scientists at IU to think more about how the science is being used. And three years ago, I think it was, we know that there are a lot of students uh, that are not getting science at the elementary school level. And so anytime that we can provide our elementary teachers with science specific topics, um, professional development in science, they go back to the classrooms excited. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that science is not taught at the elementary school level, but when you survey students at the elementary school level, science is their favorite subject. And so we should be utilizing science. And, and the, the argument is always, well, you know, you got the curriculum bullies of mathematics, you got the curriculum bullies of literacy, but you can utilize science as a vehicle to teach literacy, as a vehicle to teach mathematics. So making sure that we provide science-specific professional development to our uh, elementary school teachers is paramount to, to getting students to understand uh, climate science and also, of course, just to be scientifically literate. Next slide. We are very excited this year that we have some new uh, workshops. The geoengineering workshop took place in October, but it's not too late to sign up. We have two or three spaces left in the natural disasters workshop that's coming up next weekend. So I know you want to, you love giving up your weekends. So, <laughs> so this is for you. Next Saturday, we're doing a workshop um, and we have Cody Kirkpatrick and uh, Mike Hamburger, who are fantastic um, uh, professors of earth and atmospheric science. And they're going to be talking about natural disasters and they're going to have some unique spins on this as well. So it's, they're going to talk about obviously how it relates to, to climate change, but also how it relates to climate justice. Uh, and then in the spring, we have two more workshops and we have some spaces in those as well. One is on climate modeling and one is going to be on climate justice. And this has sort of pushed us out of our own comfort zone as well. Uh, we chose topics that we know are very, very important. And then we had to sit down and think about how are we going to teach this at a, at a high school level, at a middle school level, and possibly even at an elementary school level. Uh, overall, our impact has exceeded what we expected. You know, each year we figured, oh, we're only going to work with 20 teachers. But what I love about this is this program, certainly every teacher that we work with has a multiplicative approach. They go out and they teach not only 100 students each year, but they are that year, but they teach 100 students every year uh, subsequent. So um, overall, we've now worked with over 200 teachers. Next slide. And impacting over 20,000 students now in four short years. And then those includes pandemic years. So. Uh, we're very, very proud of our program and how the program is growing overall. Next slide. Uh, we are in our one university, so we have to, uh, there has to be an assessment and evaluation component of this. We want to make sure that our programs work. And we do that, of course, through teacher workshop evaluations, but we also do that through um, uh, surveys. Uh, one is on climate 
change and the understanding of climate change. And the other one is on teacher efficacy, teaching climate change. Next slide. One of, one of the things that I'm most proud of from an, from an education standpoint is that all of our workshops get rated between very good and excellent uh, by the participating teachers. Next slide. And overall, all of our teachers, 100% um, of the teachers that have participated have said that they've increased their understanding of how the climate is changing. 97% said that they, they increased their understanding of how humans are causing climate change. And 100% uh, agree that they expect to apply what they learn in class, which is really, really important because we have so much professional development. Like you guys this weekend were given so much stuff. And now what you adopt and what you apply from this, this conference it may only be a small sliver of what you actually learned this week, right? So one of the things that we're really, really proud of is that our, our adoption and application rate of our teachers going back into their classroom and teaching climate change is really, really high. Mm -hmm. Carol Mullins, I see your question. Have you thought about Train the Trainer program to expand outreach? Train the Trainer is really, really great if you have scripted curriculum. So if I, if I just go to you and I say, here's a great make and take uh, activity that you can do with students, then train the trainer can be very effective that way. Um, but if what we're trying to do is create sort of these bi-directional benefits between you and these IU environmental scientists, it takes a little bit more work than that. And so one of the things that, that we find is that climate change is a topic that is not easy to teach. And so train the trainer uh, I think would lose its fidelity in our professional development model. Uh, it's not to say that I'm against train the trainer. I think anything that, that we're doing to get more teachers teaching climate change is good, uh, but I'm not 100% convinced that train the trainer is the right model for that. But that's a really, really good question. Um, this was one of the workshop evaluations. This is one of my favorite um, workshops. It's been mind blowing, overwhelming, and exciting. I think that. Those are three reactions that we all have when we go to new workshops and new programs. Um, and to, to, I, I always talk to my own students in science education that if students aren't sitting in their classroom thinking about how they're going to apply what they learn, they're probably not learning it, right? So if you're sitting here right now going, oh, I think I might want to get involved in educating for environmental change, great. All right. And or maybe if um, if in my next two activities, you're sitting there thinking, I really want to bring this into my class. I'll, I'll figure out how I'm going to do that. That's really, really good. Um, and that's really where we want our teachers to be when they come to our workshops. They're thinking about how they're going to take what we're giving them and take it back and make it their own. So what are we going to do down the road? Well, a couple of things. We, look, we're just now getting started on this professional development model. Um, there's not a lot of people out there doing what we're doing where, that are connecting the, the environmental scientists to K-12 teachers. So we're going to continue to refine the model. Um, one of the things that's really important is that we get out of our own echo chamber. All the teachers that really come to our Educative Environmental Change Workshop so far are already teaching climate change. They just want more strategies. They want more approaches. That's great. But one of the things that we need to do is we need to reach out to those teachers that might be a little bit more skeptical or might not feel like they have the support of their administration and really get to them and, and, and talk to them about ways and strategies that they can bring climate change education into their classrooms. And of course, to do that, we wanna, we wanna hear how other programs are doing this, like Cornell's Paleontological Research Institution. Um, they're an organization right now that's doing the opposite of what the Heartland Institute is doing. They actually wrote a book about how teachers can teach climate change, and they're trying to get that book out to as many people as possible. Next slide. Just a couple uh, final notes about educating for environmental change. Uh, first of all, this uh, PowerPoint will be made available to you. So if you want to know more, you can go to this link. Uh, this project is supported by the Environmental Resilience Institute at Indiana University as part of our Grand Challenge program. Uh, the Grand Challenge initiative is titled Prepare for Environmental Change. So we've named our program Educating for Environmental Change. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is that in 2020, uh, our program uh, won the Governor's Award for extraordinary initiatives in protecting the environment. So we're on the rise, we're growing, and, uh, and if you want to be a part of it, we'd love to have you be a part of it. Okay, next slide. So what do we do with teachers? Well, a couple of things that I like to do with teachers is I like to talk to them specifically about science methodology. And so what I'm going to do next is talk a little bit about addressing student misconceptions. 
and in eliciting surfacing student thinking and then addressing student misconceptions. This is a video, I'm not gonna show this to you right now. This is about a six or seven minute video. If you've never seen this before, it's really, really good. It's a fun video, it comes from an organization called WIMP that makes these great scientific videos. Um, but what this is, is it's 50 common science misconceptions that lots of people have. So one of the things that, that I really want all of my science education students to understand is that everybody's got science misconceptions, right? Uh, depending upon how we were taught, depending upon all the different funds of knowledge that we bring to the table, we, we wind up developing these, these misconceptions. So for instance, um, my daughter came home recently and she was learning in school about uh, the, um, she was learning about the brontosaurus. The brontosaurus is a dinosaur that no longer, it, it never existed. I don't know if you know that, <laughs> right? Um, so there's, there's lots of different things that are, are being taught that, did you know that the brontosaurus never existed? It was the head of one dinosaur with the body of another dinosaur. And for years it was taught as, this, as its own species, but it's not its own species, right? Um, another example, students are still being taught that there are only five senses, right? And when in fact we have lots of senses, thirst, hunger, uh, proprioception, there's all kinds of senses that we have. A balance is a sense, but we teach the classical five senses as the only senses that, that humans have, right? So we have lots of misconceptions. Next slide. One of the famous videos of misconceptions that was out there um, was the Annenberg videos that came out when, when I was younger and many years before some of you were born. Uh, but the Annenberg videos were, were very famous. They were put, uh, one of the videos was titled A Private Universe. And what they did is they asked uh, a bunch of Harvard graduates, they sort of snuck up on them on their, on their graduation day. I thought it was a, a bit of a sneaky study. And they asked them basic science questions like, why do we have seasons? And so you would go, oh, well, they went to Harvard. Of course they'll understand that you know, we have seasons because of the tilt of the Earth's axis and the parallelism of the tilt. And many of those students said, oh no, we have seasons because sometimes we're closer to the sun, sometimes we're farther from the sun, right? So a lot of adults have scientific misconceptions. And I think that accepting that and then going, well, how do we surface these misconceptions and how do we express them is really, really important in any sort of scientific endeavor. So uh, next. So one of my favorite stories that came out of Annenberg was they asked a student, for instance, uh, he was an elementary school student, and they placed an apple in front of him. And they said, how do you see this apple? And he goes, well, I got this. They look at the apple. And energy shoots out of my eyeballs and it hits the apple and then it bounces back into my head and then my brain interprets it. And I'm like, that's amazing. Like, that is a very interesting idea. And they said, um, could you draw it for us? Right? Which is really important in, in science education, getting students to, to draw it. In science education research, we call this making two dimensional conceptual models, but it's just a drawing, right? And so we asked our students to make drawings. So they asked them to make a drawing. And he showed like lightning shooting out of his eyeballs. <laughs> and they're like, this is so interesting. How did you come up with this? And he goes, oh, I watch a lot of nature shows. And they said, what, what shows in particular? And he goes, oh, I was watching a show about bats. Let's say, you know, we're all shaking our heads. So at first we're sitting there going, that's kid's nuts. And now we're sitting there going, I get it. What that student did is what we want all of our students to do. We always talk about in science education, all my students, they never transfer knowledge from one concept to another. That student transferred knowledge, right? He was transferring this idea of bats echolocation to how he sees. Which, by the way, there's another science misconception. Bats have eyes. They see. You're, you're an environmentalist. <laughs> anyway, but the point is, is that that student transferred knowledge. And so if no one ever elicits that knowledge, and if no one ever addresses it, that's an adult walking around thinking that energy shoots out of his eyeballs, right? Next. Now you might sit there and go, well, a lot of elementary students are gonna have misconceptions, but what about older students? By, by the time they get to high school, they don't have misconceptions. There was a great study by Vanessa Kind in 2007. And what she did is she went into AP chemistry classes and she said, um, Here's Alka-Seltzer and here's water. 
When I drop Alka Seltzer into water, I want you to draw what's going to happen. And the students went ahead and they started drawing. And some of the students wrote things like it's a chemical reaction. They knew it was a chemical reaction. But some of the students, these are AP chemistry students, wrote things like bubbles trapped in Alka Seltzer, which tells you that they have no fundamental understanding of what a chemical reaction is. Now, on a multiple choice test, they're going to get the question right. They might even be able to balance the equation. They might even know what the reactants and the products are. But they have a fundamental misunderstanding of the basic concepts of chemistry. And so if we don't surface these student things, then we're not going to be able to address it. So how do I surface student thinking? Or how do I get uh, my science education students or educating for environmental change students to do it? Next slide. We use these great formative assessment probes. And no, I didn't write this. I wish I had. Um, uh, if you've never seen this before, have you seen these books before? These come out of NSTA Press. They're called Uncovering Student Ideas Books. They're written by um, a, a former teacher. Her name was Paige Keeley. And she took the hard work out of this for us. What she did is she wrote a whole bunch of books where she looked at what are the misconceptions in science in different topics. What are the misconceptions in biology? What are they in chemistry? What are they in pre-K to two, right? And she looked at all these different misconceptions, and then she wrote these simple formative assessment probes. Next slide. Next. Um, next. And this is the oops, yeah. Oops, so that's oops, the way. Sorry. That's okay. Keep going. No, no, that's okay. next one. That's all right. You can go. Next. And so this is what a, a, a probe might look like. So now a lot of these probes. They're kind of just in worksheet form, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of worksheets, but you could do these prompts a million different ways, right? You could just talk about them. You could have these written on the board. There's lots of different ways that you could utilize it. But one of the things that's really, really important if we're going to talk about climate change is getting students to understand the difference between climate and weather, which many of our, many adults that we know don't know the difference, and certainly many of our politicians don't understand the difference, right? So here's a simple probe that, that uh, Paige Keeley wrote, and it goes like this. Mr. and Mrs. Martin were watching the news one evening in January. The news anchor announced that Florida was experiencing one of the coldest winters ever recorded in the state. The temperature even dropped to a low of 32 degrees in Miami. It snowed in some parts of Florida. Mr. and Mrs. Martin looked at each other and said, <laughs> Mr. Martin, wow, that's the biggest change in our weather. Mrs. Martin, wow, that's the biggest change in our climate. <laughs> and then the question is, who do you agree with most and why? Simple probes like that. Right, and there's lots of them, and so there's probes about you know is this uh, is this part of global warming? Is it not part of global warming? There's all kinds of probes in here that are really really good. So of course, what we want students to understand is that climate is very different than weather. The climate takes place over thirty plus more years, um, and weather takes place on a year to year basis. But what is the research behind this? Next, eighty percent. 80% of middle school and high school students thought it was true or mostly true that climate changes from year to year. So if we don't address this misconception, then we're going to have a really tough time teaching the other concepts of climate change. I was working with um, a professor in earth and atmospheric science, and his work is in uh, waterways, waterways in Indiana, and specifically in Indiana's watersheds. And he did something unique during the pandemic. He called me and he said, I've come up with an idea for my, my students because they had to do something online. And he said, so he had his, his um, college students write middle school lesson plans. And I thought that was such a great idea because if you have to explain something at the middle school level, you really understand it, right? And if you have to come up with a good lesson plan. So, um, so I told the students about this book and let me share you the probe that, that went with watersheds. I think this one's pretty good. It asks, what is a watershed? You can click a couple, yeah. So five friends were talking about watersheds. They each had different ideas of what a watershed is. This is what they said. Uh, first student, I think a watershed is an undeveloped area of branching creeks, brooks, and streams that flow down a mountain or mountain range. Penny, I think a watershed is a group of buildings uh, and human-made structures that water drains off of. Um, and you get the point, right? Five different students' ideas. And of course, click next. It says, which friend do you agree with most and why? These are simple, simple probes. Again, it's, it's like, why didn't I think of this? And it's based on the research of these student misconceptions. So they're really, really good. It's a great strategy to use. 
So it just gets students to explain their thinking. And, and more importantly, it gets them engaging in that scientific practice of engaging in argument from evidence, right? So next, next, right? So the research that went into that probe, it says to elicit students' ideas about watersheds, a study was conducted that asked students to draw a picture. Again, two-dimensional conceptual models, getting students to surface their thinking a little bit and explain the drawing. Results of the study show that students understand a watershed from a very limited scientific perspective. This next one is pretty important. Several sixth and seventh grade students described or drew watersheds as water storage facilities. Well, that makes sense, yeah. right? I mean, you think like, oh, everybody understands what a watershed is. No, they don't. When I lived in a city on the East Coast, I remember watching people pour paint down <laughs> the, the, the water drains, right? They don't know where that water goes. It's incredibly important that we, that we teach our students about watersheds. And of course, in our vernacular, a shed is something that might be in our backyard. So it makes sense that it'd be a human-made structure. Next slide. Um, that same study investigated the effects of watershed curriculum on students' geo geoscience learning. They found that some students thought of watersheds as water towers or, or well houses, what we just said. And they concurred that because of our everyday language containing the word shed seems to apply some kind of structure. Next slide. But this is really, really important. A sample study showed that 41% of adults surveyed had, had any idea about what a watershed is, and only 22% knew that stormwater runoff was a major cause of stream pollution. 22% of adults. You got a lot. <laughs> I, but, but I also want you to leave here energized, right? <laughs> We've done You're a lot doing work this work. <laughs> there will always be work. We might run out of money, but we're always going to have work. This is good. Next slide. Uh, could the resources books shared during this presentation be shared at some point, or are they already available? They're already available at NSTA Press. Uh, I promise I don't make a dime from this, but I think they're just really, really good resources for both informal and formal educators to look at. But whenever you're teaching a topic, you should look at these probes and see what are the misconceptions that are aligned with it and what are the probes that we can use. The other thing, too, is you don't have to use them as, um, again, you don't have to use them as worksheets. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can utilize them. Uh, so, for instance, there's one probe that asks, is this a sign of global warming? And it asks, and there's like 10 different things that it asks them, is this a sign of global warming? And you can do that. You can write all those out on cards and then say, you know, have the students put them in pile sorts, like this is global warming, this isn't global warming, and then make arguments about whether or not they agree with those things. All right. So my third and final act of this, of this is uh, an exemplar activity. And I just wanted to give you some idea, not only of a pedagogical strategy that we use, which is these books, but also an activity that we do. And so um, this activity, well, I don't want to give it away yet. So let me, let me ask you this, because I haven't, uh, involve you at all in my my presentation. How do we know that the climate is changing? Less snow in the winter. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we got a little of today, but yeah, little. Yeah. But but we're definitely seeing seasonal changes, right? Yeah. What else? Well, if you look at the maps of the world, you can see the shape of Antarctica and a lot of ice around it is different than it was 1500. Yeah, for sure. So we can we can just look at photographs of, of glaciers and, mm -hmm. and certainly our polar regions. What else? How else do we know climate change? I'll also add bird migration. So you've got birds that are, and other animals are now migrating to areas where they are. Yeah, one of my. By the way, one of my favorite probes that Paige Keeley wrote is a probe about adaptation, and a lot of students have this idea that if we change the if we change the environment, that animals will just be able to move to a new place and adapt. It is one of the most important things that we need to teach our students that these animals will not be able to survive if we change their environment rapidly. They will not be able to just adapt. They are not humans. They cannot manipulate their, their environment the way that we can. Um, so yeah, certainly uh, biodiversity loss and changes in biodiversity, and of course, bird migrations, animal migrations, how else do we know that the environment is changing? Our extreme, like weather. Yeah, our weather, of course. For, for sure, natural disasters, absolutely. More frequent, uh, our, our droughts, um, our, our rainy seasons. Yeah, for sure. What else? Fires. 
Yeah, yeah. so uh, right. Great, great article that came out today in the Washington Post about um, uh, there was a journalist that, that was working with the teachers that were teaching after the Camp Fire fire in California. Um, and it's so good. It, I really recommend all of you reading it. Um, it, it it's remarkable. But yeah, certainly the, the fires are, are something. So one of the things, next slide, our next uh, point. There we go. So when we when scientists look at this, they have what, what they call essential climate variables. Uh, some are atmospheric, some are terrestrial, and some are oceanic. And it doesn't matter that students know all of these, right? I, I'm not a big fan of, of memorizing uh, this type of, of data, but getting students to understand what are the most important data points that environmental scientists are looking at so that we can understand climate science. And one of, the, one of those uh, data points, of course, is our ice. So this activity, is investigating ice cores. Now, this, the next generation science standards, really, one of the, I think one of the best conceptual shifts in science education that's happened over the last 20 years is this is explicit use of models. And so here's my model of an ice core. I gotta put on my gloves because my hands can. <laughs> Do any of you uh, use ice cores in here? Have you done this before? These are relatively easy to make, um, but I'll talk about how I made it in a second, but I just want you to take a look at it. What are some things that you notice about our ice cores? Yeah, and so what do you think in real ice cores? This is my model ice core. What do you think in real ice cores would cause these bands? So if I were to go to a polar region, the Arctic or the Antarctic, and I and I take an ice core out of the ground. What would cause these bands to be made? Temperature, temperature, for sure. So like the melting and then the and the freezing, and then what else? So it could, it could, especially if there's some glaciation and there's some movement. Um, yeah, for sure. But if we're in like a polar region. What do you think would cause the, the layers? What would cause the layering? Mm. Got some ideas up there. Oh, oh, good. Sedimentation, freeze and thaw, cataclysmic events. Yeah, Carol, you're on it. Very good. I'll get. I'll talk about that in a second. So, what's going to cause each one of these layers is that each year the snowfall is going to come down and it's going to get compacted. And over thousands of years, then we have these ice cores and we've got all of these layers and it can tell us lots of things. So next slide, please. Next one. <laughs> next one. <laughs> there we go. Got it. <laughs> all right. Uh, so these compressed layers are really, really great because they can tell us not only the age in some cases, but what they have is that some of these layers, you can see things like volcanic dust. And that creates what we call reference horizons in our ice core. So if there's a large volcanic explosion, like I remember, I think it was in 2008 or 2009, I had a friend that got trapped in Europe by that, uh, an ice, that Icelandic uh, <laughs> volcano that no one can pronounce, right? That thing exploded <laughs> and it created this huge plume over, over Europe and it caused all planes to be grounded in that area. And so we know that when, when, when we look at ice cores, we can look and we can see, oh, there's a band that may have been caused by that volcano, right? Same thing here. So my model ice core has some different colored bands. Those different colors may be caused by volcanic ash or layers of dust. And of course, what's great about ice cores is they don't just trap the, uh, the precipitation. They also contain, when they freeze, they, they, they freeze air inside of it. So we not, we not only know uh, what the precipitation levels are of a period of time, but we can also tell by looking at an ice core what was in the atmosphere at the time. And that's what makes looking at ice cores so great uh, for, for students to understand what's happened in climate change over time. So uh, next slide. So then what we do is we have the students look at these model ice cores that we created in our freezers. By the way, we just all you do is you, you just keep adding different layers 
over periods of time. I think I started this on Thursday <laughs> and I just added like a little bit of what, you know, I just had a little note to myself, add another layer, add another layer. <laughs> Right. And then what I did uh, to make the darker layers is you add a little tea or a little coffee. Uh, if you want to, you can put a few rocks in there. If you're working with little kids, you might add like some insects, talk about changes, things like that, and have the students make observations about them. Right. The most famous ice core data uh, came from the, the 1980s. The Vostok ice core was 3,350 meters long. That means we have a whole lot of history, right? If down here is the oldest point, We've got a lot of history in our in our ice core. Next slide. So what we do is then we we give the students the data from the Vostok ice core. So we have them in, look at look at our models, talk about how ice cores work, why scientists look at ice core data, and then we have them look at the data itself. Um, so our driving questions is how has the Earth changed over time? How am I doing on time? We're doing You've well. You've got right? fifteen minutes. Oh, okay. And then uh, how has uh, the trend of of change fluctuated in recent past? So. Let's take a look at our first graph. First off, what we want students to recognize when they look at our data is we want students to recognize that this is modern day, right? And this goes back in time. So how old is our Vostok ice core data? How far back does it go? Yeah, somewhere in that range, 425 maybe. Yeah, you're sitting way back there. It's hard to see these little <laughs> things up here. It's about 425,000 years of data that we can see. Now, what's happening here is that this is temperature that's rising and falling. And so what do we notice? What are the, what's the lowest temperature that, that the Earth reached um, over 425,000 years? Just approximately. What do you think? Yeah. About negative eight, maybe negative nine down here. Negative nine, because this is 10, eight. Yeah, so about negative nine degrees Celsius. What's the highest temperature that we reach? And, and again, these are average temperatures, so it's really important to talk to students about that. Yeah, so about three, okay? So what we know is over 425,000 years, our temperature has gone between about negative nine and three. And what happens is one of the things that's important to point out is that when we get down here, we're in an ice age, right? And when we get up here, we're coming out of it. So we have glacial periods and interglacial periods. Very good. Next slide. Now what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on a few more of these data points in particular. So again, this is still Vostok data. And we're going to look um, specifically, go back one more. Can you go back? We're going to look just at this portion of it. All right, so let's zoom in on it. Oh. Too far. There we go. So again, we're just looking at the temperature and it's just got a few more data points. And so what we can see again is that the temperature goes up maybe, I don't know, about one degree and down to about minus six, somewhere in that range, maybe minus seven is the lowest point. Everybody got it? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the ice, ice core data. Instead of looking at temperature, we're gonna look at carbon dioxide levels. Next slide. What do you notice? You go back and forward. What do you notice? Yeah. Now, again, one of the things that's important to point out to students is that correlation is not necessarily causation, right? We want students to understand that. But we definitely see a correlation here. We can see a correlation between when the, when the CO2 levels drop and when they rise, it drops and rises with temperature. Right? We see a correlation there. Also, what is the lowest point uh, in terms of carbon dioxide levels? Yeah, about 180. And what's the highest point? About 300. Does everybody see that? This is why I think it's so important for students to investigate ice cores because when they start looking at the data, they can start really analyzing this for themselves. Next slide. Now let's take a look at CO2 levels over not 150,000 years. Let's look at it over 800,000 years. And again, we can understand this because ice core data helps us understand this. So the lowest point that we see with CO2 levels is about 100 and, I don't know, 170 parts per million, 160 parts per million. And the highest point that we see is about 300 parts per million. 
So over 800,000 years, our CO2 levels, lowest point, 170, highest point, 300. Everybody see that? And so having students uh, look at that is really important. The other thing that's really important to do when, you, when you're doing this with students, make sure you talk to them about what parts per million means. Mm -hmm. Like have them try to visualize like a million ping pong balls. <laughs> and that a, a couple hundred of them, does it really make that much of a difference, right? And then we can also talk about why carbon dioxide, why methane, why these gases cause these changes in our atmosphere. But we'll get to that next, all right? So we know that temperature has gone between, what do we say, minus nine to about three. And we know that uh, carbon dioxide has gone between about 170 to about 300 for 800,000 years. What's our carbon dioxide level at today? <laughs> when I was born, it was at 311 parts per million, which is still kind of in line here, right? We've seen it at 300 before. It's not that far out of whack. But we are now in my lifetime. Next slide. Next slide. We're now way up here. And by the way, this slide is a few years old. So next slide. As of May, and this slide is also a few months old. <laughs> as of May, we were at 492. So getting students just to understand that is to me paramount for their overall understanding of global warming in particular. And then they can talk about how that global warming is contributing to climate change. Right. But if they don't understand this, then they're really going to have a hard time understanding other topics that can follow it. Next slide. So I'd like to leave with a couple of things. Climate change in 10 words. It's real. It's us. It's bad. Scientists agree. But there's hope. And now it's also important to talk to the students about where is the hope. One of the things that we often do whenever we finish educating for environmental change workshops, is we talk about uh, all the people that are working on this project, that are working to, to solve climate change. We talk about the Montreal Protocol uh, that when, when I was growing up, and you don't even remember this, but Jim and I remember it. When we were growing up, the ozone layer was, was it, uh, we were gonna die of cancer because the ozone layer was not getting better. And then, what was it, 170 countries signed the Montreal Protocol in the late 1980s and all agreed to it and then did it. And they stopped using chlorofluorocarbons and our ozone layer started coming back. We're not talking about the ozone layer in schools anymore, but it's because it's been, because we had good policy decisions that changed that. Next. Uh, then what we do, of course, is we follow this up with having the students look at their own carbon footprint, uh, which can be, can be scary for kids when they start realizing their own impact. But, um, next slide. Uh, so this is uh, one of the carbon footprint. I don't know if you, you, you do carbon footprints with your, your students, carbon footprint calculators. This is the one I use, but there's lots of different versions. Um, next slide. Um, Excellent. So what can we do is their hope. One of my favorite things to do then is after they determine this, is they we then look, take them to the end roads. Have you used the end roads before? Let me show you end roads. Next slide. You can, uh, next one. <laughs> <laughs> go. This is what it looks like. I, I didn't want to pull it up on the web, so I made a screenshot of it. But this is really cool. End roads. What they do is you can qualitatively change all of these things. And if you want, uh, if you're working with older students, you can quantitatively do it. You can click these little buttons here and it'll allow you to qual quantitatively change it. And so what it says is, okay, what happens if I uh, decrease the amount of deforestation that's currently happening on the planet? And when you do that, this little line will come down just a little bit. And then what if I do deforestation and we also increase electrification? And we move it from like the status quo way over here, then it comes down even further. And it gets students to really understand hey, policy changes 
can make a big difference here. If we vote for the right people that have that that have the right plans, we really can make a difference. And um, and so this is one of the things that I one of the tools that we utilize in educating for environmental change to get students to think about um, all the different ways and all the permutations for how we can make our environment better. Right? Next slide. Uh, so then we ask them what solutions they think will work best, and then they come up with that. Next. All right, and those are the resources. Are there any questions? You can click the next button. Yeah, questions. questions. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I teach at Indian University, and they use this department, but I'm curious. I am not, we are not currently, but we are hoping to do that. Please, so, please come our way. So, I teach some of the education practices, like, um, you know, children's literature, but I'm not, you know, in there and listening, not being on the side. But I do, but I know we have a, a very rich um, science education program there. I think that we need to be working with, with our, um, you know, current campus here. <laughs> I agree. And I think that we should be working with you as well. Uh, we actually, Jim Poison and I just wrote uh, a grant to the Pisces Foundation uh, to scale some of our programs to all the satellite campuses at Indiana University. So um, if that money doesn't come through, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't work with you. We should work with you anyway. I think Educating for Environmental Change is a program that we're always looking for new partners. And, it, and the gravity of it, look, the, the purpose is so rich and meaningful, but the gravity of this program keeps pulling people in. And that's what I love about it. So, um, you know, we get undergraduate students, graduate students that just want to be a part of the program because they know how important this, yeah. this topic is. You may have had this experience as well, but I, when I also did um, climate change issues in my writing classes, and when I started teaching back in 2000, so a lot of climate, climate deniers, I felt like they were saying most of the thing that you know, this is bad and that <laughs> they've all disappeared. I mean, they, these students come in, they know the gravity of the situation, and I, when I do this in a writing class, I have a bunch of education majors and a bunch of projects, a project that we solve the problem. Their solution, of course, is teaching in classrooms, and they're very eager to know these things. So, but I think that I've got a lot of students from from the from the regional campuses. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we could just start closing the loop just within our system. That would be great. I think we can work with the state. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I totally <laughs> agree. Um, I I also want to just address this idea of addressing students that have um, not misconceptions but, but are deniers or, yeah. or skeptical yeah. so one of the one of the studies that came out recently um, was one about the use of what's called evidence-weighted narratives in the classroom so we can't just throw data at students and i know that i just did that um, <laughs> we have to follow this up with some really important stories and narratives um, and so getting students to hear from people who identify similarly as they do. Um, for instance, getting that farmer to come into the classroom to talk about the fact that, hey, I didn't believe in climate change, but I've now had three 100-year floods in the last 10 years. Um, or I didn't believe in it, and, but, but I've had 20% crop reduction. And it doesn't just have to be a farmer, it could be anyone. But getting students, that, because if they don't hear from people like when they hear from us, they expect Indiana University to be teaching climate change, right? So they need to hear from people who have overcome sort of the skepticism and, and that, that it isn't just about the data, but this is really impacting people in, an everyday, uh, in their everyday lives. Um, and sometimes I feel like, like working with all the scientists, we forget that because we have so much data. Uh, there is, you know, there are so many different ways that we can approach this topic. And I think getting back to the, that question that came up earlier, can we do a train the trainer? I think with some of these activities we could, but with the bigger picture, it's hard. We really need teachers to sort of dive deeper. So for instance, we just did that workshop on geoengineering and I was very concerned about the teachers who hadn't been at our other workshops showing up at that geoengineering and going back to their classroom and going this is our solution folks we we're gonna we're gonna science our way out of this that's not how it's gonna work we're gonna have to policy our way out we're gonna have to science our way out and we're gonna have to educate our way out. so yeah so here's what i'm worried about 
<laughs> have you done the final action? So, so I think ideally, I'm going to include the same. Maybe even something approaching next generation. It's just, it's just a feeling. I don't have an inside scoop. I wish I wish I was as uh, hopeful as you. But go ahead. <laughs> Let's say it improves because it has. They're going to improve. They're embarrassed about how fast. Yes, right. and they're going to improve, and they're and they're NGSSifying their standards right. much more. Yes. So that happens, yes. and now we have the same parents that are anti-masker and anti-critical race theory and anti-black lives. You know what I mean? Yes, yes sir. Right, right, right. Are going to be going these identity politics issues? Yes. About their kids being bamboozled by each other. I mean, I mean, I'm worried about that, but I'm wondering if your your organization. Is developing strategies either part of the workshops or adding the workshops? How can we, how can parents and, and school board members actually be, be ready for this? Because I don't think our school board, I think they were surprised by the, the, the critical race theory. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, I, there is a political side to all of this. Yeah. Um, and, and you can't get away from it. The, the, the bottom line is that the reason, in my opinion, why Indiana did adopt next generation science standards more than any other reason is because it came on the heels of Common Core. Had Common Core not, not been adopted years before and this in a disastrous rollout of assessing for Common Core and evaluating Common Core, um, it became very political. And so states just, red states said, we don't want it. But interestingly enough, there were red states that did adopt it. Like I said, Kentucky, of all states, adopted NextGen. Um, but Indiana, what they did is they just plagiarized NextGen <laughs> and took out the part they didn't like. Yeah. And they removed all of the really important parts. They removed the assessment boundaries and the clarification statements and all those things. So um, I'm hopeful, like you, that this will be the first step of what will be many steps. As far as addressing family members, I think we just need to do a better job. I think that schools are not, shouldn't just be places that, that teach children. Schools should be learning centers for the community. And so, and, and I don't wanna put anything more on schools. They're already understaffed and, and overwhelmed. But I think that we need to figure out ways that we can utilize our community centers better to, have conversations like this um, with them and not just be in echo chambers. Um, you know, I think all of us in this room uh, agree that this is an important topic, but we need to get people in this room that, that are skeptical about this being taught and talk to them about uh, why it's important and, and do it in a way that, and do it in a way that doesn't, that's, you know, um, that's approachable. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Do we have anything? Yeah, I, can I put a point on it? Sure. I, I'm curious mm -hmm. if it's possible to develop a workshop for school board members. They're only going to attend if they volunteer and want to. Yeah. But again, what I'm worried about is we're not going to be prepared for the shouting of the school board meeting. Everybody's so exhausted by the shouting today. Is there any sort of thing? I mean, what I'd like to do is to then how do we train high school students to work with school teachers to educate on science? That might be one angle, but that the school boards um, themselves, I don't know, I don't know how to get to them. I don't know what that process would be. No, it's such a great program for teachers. Is there a way to develop that program? I, I, I think that that's a really good question. And I, I can tell you that in other programs that I've developed in the past, we brought in school administrators, we haven't done school boards. But, but we know grant from them. I know we, we <laughs> know how important it is. We know how important it is for schools, you know, if they're gonna if they're gonna do transformative education practices, they need the support of administrators that understand what good what effective practices look like. And so bringing those administrators to uh, the workshops can be a really effective uh, program. And, and and so I think that might be a next step for educating for our own change. I don't know if that includes school board members. I would love for it to. Uh, I, look, the more people we can get in front of these scientists, the better, because they're not only good at the science, they're really good at communicating. 
So if you come, by the way, next weekend, I know you love giving up your Saturdays. Mm -hmm. If you come next weekend, don't think of it as giving up. Think of it what you're gonna get. Um, and there are stipends, by the way. So it's a hundred dollar stipends uh, for the teachers. But these two educators next weekend are phenomenal. They're really, really good, and they really care about their science. So I think it'd be great if, if uh, any of you want to come. We still have a few spaces, right? Are there any other questions? All right. Well, again, thank you so much for sticking around on the final day of the final workshop. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, you very you much. A lot of competition too. Our keynote speaker, uh, what is his name? Dennis Schaap. Yeah. NSPA came in from Seattle to kind of dig in deeper into what his keynote was. Oh, so, cool. So it might be something that you. I, I know we don't have much time left, but I'm going to go back to meet Dennis and find yeah, out what he's doing. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to talk to anyone about our program. And by the way, so I'm going to give Stephanie both my PowerPoint and um, and then maybe also a few more resources. Can I send them to you? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and give you the resources for that ice core activity. Because I really, I did, I did in 20 minutes what you would normally do in a few days. I think everybody saw the big picture of it. Hi, Carol. <laughs> Carol. I think been Carol. with this, Carol's been with this the whole weekend. That's her pop up. Yep. yep. <laughs> Indianapolis Square. Great question. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Carol says hi. <laughs> <laughs> we were just at uh, high, high school together. So a couple of those.